Do you know when our ancestors first landed on land? Do you know the arduous evolution they went through during that time? In this episode, follow my narration and experience a marvelous evolutionary story about our terrestrial vertebrate ancestors. Once a teacher told me that everyone has their own place. This statement has always stayed with me and ultimately led me to embark on the path of scientific communication. Similarly, there is also an animal group that has experienced a long and tumultuous journey, feeling the whims of fate and tasting the vicissitudes of life until they found their destined place. The story begins in the shallow seas of Kujing, you know. It was there that fish first dominated and underwent their initial radiation adaptation. You can learn more about these events in my current episode. Among the rising fish in that era, there was a familiar yet unexpected figure, which I call the dreamlike ghost fish. All its characteristics indicate that it belongs to the most prosperous vertebrate group on our planet, bony fishes. The vast majority of fish we know today, including all terrestrial vertebrates, belong to the evolutionary branch of bony fishes. Originally, we believed that bony fishes appeared much later as so-called higher vertebrates after the emergence of fish. However, this ghost fish appeared almost at the same time as the earliest jawed fishes, such as Entelognathus, in terms of survival age. It seemed to have emerged from a dream, appearing unexpectedly in a different time and space. It tells us that bony fishes are actually a very ancient branch among jawed fishes. Moreover, some subsequent discoveries have hinted at an incredible long buried truth. About 423 million years ago, during the Silurian period, Megamastax amblyotus appeared as the earliest known top predator fish. Although its fossils are incomplete, it is highly likely that it was also a bony fish. If that is the case, it means that bony fishes are the authentic branch of vertebrates. Although they are called bony fishes, early bony fishes were not quite as their name suggests. They were similar to sharks today, having cartilage instead of true bones. If we were to describe their special feature at that time, it would be the development of an organ called the swim bladder. In the early bony fishes, the swim bladder was directly connected to the pharynx. Fish could use it to float to the water's surface, take in air, and store it. The muscles and blood vessels near the swim bladder could change its volume, thereby altering the whole fish's body density, allowing these bony fishes to move up and down the water with less effort. Here, I must clarify that bony fishes can generally be divided into two main branches, lobe fin fishes and ray fin fishes. The ray fin fishes are the group that appeared later in evolution. The early bony fishes, including the dream-like ghost fish, actually share more similarities in appearance with the later lobe fin fishes. So, for the sake of simplicity, let's refer to both the early bony fishes and the later true lobe fin fishes as lobe fin fishes. As previously mentioned, fish quickly outgrew their satisfaction with the shallow seas of Yunnan. They began to spread across the entire world, rapidly overturning the old world, conquering new territories. During this process of world domination, various fish groups displayed their unique abilities. The placoderms, armored and armed, proved unbeatable. The cartilaginous fishes, light and agile, excelled in chasing fast-swimming prey. The spiny sharks efficiently occupied the habitat of small invertebrates and armored fishes. However, amidst the competition for dominance in their respective territories, the lobe-finned fishes found themselves in a rather awkward position. Their body structure was most suitable for being top predators, but the already established placoderms had a significant advantage over them, exerting absolute dominance. This challenging environment resulted in the lobe-finned fishes facing obstacles throughout the marine world. After millions of years of evolution, one group that eventually emerged is known as the coelacanths. Their body structure is incredibly conservative, seemingly designed exclusively for surviving in narrow spaces. This, however, almost destroyed their evolutionary potential, making them the most conservative group in vertebrates. 
They have undergone little change for nearly 400 million years, making them true living fossils. At this time, the lobe-finned fishes might be thinking, what a cruel fate. I was once the original ruler with such a prosperous start. Now, there is an excellent opportunity for vertebrates to expand their territories. But who could have imagined that while I conquered the world, I lost my own refuge? Once I competed for dominance across the seas, but now I am living in constant fear for survival. Life can be so unpredictable. However, sometimes avoiding challenges is not shameful. It might actually lead to a real turning point. Early in the Devonian period, one lobe fin fish species chose to escape the pressures of the ocean and found its destined ecological niche, freshwater. Perhaps because freshwater lacks the minerals necessary to build armor, there were hardly any large placoderms in those environments. Many freshwater ecosystems were still dominated by Europterids in the food chain. This presented a rare opportunity for the lobe-finned fishes. Additionally, some cartilaginous fish and spiny sharks had already migrated to freshwater earlier. They mostly consisted of moderate to low-level animals in the food chain, providing abundant food sources for the lobe-finned fishes. If I cannot establish myself in the ocean, then I will dominate in freshwater. Even if I am a fallen king, I shall still be a king. The lobe-finned fishes had a significant advantage in body size and bite force compared to the animals in freshwater. As a result, a group of lobe-finned fishes quickly defeated the freshwater placoderms and other fish, becoming the top predators in freshwater. One of these predators was the Hyneria lindy, which lived around 360 million years ago in the late Devonian period. They could grow up to about three meters in length and weigh around two tons. Their predation scenes on the freshwater sharks of that time are still a topic of great interest. Speaking of these early sharks, or more accurately cartilaginous fish, they indeed had a tough time. They were preyed upon by placoderms in the ocean and became the prey of lobe-finned fishes in freshwater. I can't help but think that the later evolution of sharks into fierce top predators was driven by their struggle and resistance against these adversities. But let's get back to the point. Although lobe-finned fishes were thriving in freshwater, it didn't last forever. In the later stages of the Devonian period, land plants became more abundant, and their roots formed symbiotic relationships with fungi, absorbing all the nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium from the soil below two meters. However, they couldn't fully utilize these nutrients, nor effectively manage waste, resulting in these nutrients being released into water bodies. This led to an explosive growth of algae. For fish, the most significant problem during this algal bloom was the rapid depletion of oxygen in the water. It is believed that this global anoxia event, which contributed to the late Devonian mass extinction, started in freshwater. We can even say that these freshwater fish were drowned in water during this crisis. At this critical moment, the lobe-finned fishes found a way to escape from this predicament. During the Devonian period, even though the plants were creating chaos, leading to oxygen depletion in water bodies. They also caused a significant surge in atmospheric oxygen. Do you remember the primitive open-swim bladder of the lobe-finned fishes we talked about earlier? This organ happened to be connected to the outside air and was rich in capillaries. It managed to extract a small amount of oxygen from the oxygen-rich air of the Devonian period. As a result, the swim bladder evolved into primitive lungs. The respiratory ability of lobe-finned fishes to breathe air gradually intensified from this point onward. However, in the early stages, the small amount of oxygen obtained through these primitive lungs wasn't sufficient to meet the entire oxygen requirements of the fish. It served as a supplementary source of oxygen when aquatic environments lacked sufficient oxygen. The diverse utilization of this emerging ability gave rise to two major branches, within freshwater lobe fin fishes. One of these branches is called dipnomorpha. They employed their air-breathing ability to endure challenging times. When water bodies became arid or severely oxygen-deprived, they entered a state of dormancy, lowering their metabolic rates to the minimum. This slight capacity for air-breathing was enough to sustain their survival. 
It's like having top-notch equipment that can still be used in unexpected ways. Truly a case of making the most of what you've got. Today, only three lineages of lungfish, descendants of Dipnomorpha, remain. Among them is the African lungfish, which solely relies on lung respiration and is possibly the only fish in the world that could drown when placed in water. On the other hand, there's a branch called Tetrapodomorpha that truly unlocked the correct usage of lungs. This subgroup of lobe fin fishes had already developed the ability to crawl through underwater mud during their earlier evolution. As a result, their skeletons and limb muscles were stronger than those of other vertebrates of the time. Their well-developed bones also prepared them for movement on land where buoyancy was lacking. By the way, it's possible that the complete ossification of our endoskeleton began with these fishes, making bony fishes truly bony. So, now equipped with sturdy bones and muscles and a slight ability to breathe air, the time was ripe to make the move onto land. Now the question arises, why would a fish want to venture onto land? It may seem strange, but as long as there is enough temptation, animals dare to defy all natural laws and take any risks. During the Devonian period, alongside the flourishing plants, various land animals also thrived, and some fish ultimately couldn't resist the allure of food. Among them might be the fish with legs, which started frequently surfacing and ambushing small animals at the shoreline. The animals on land at that time had never encountered vertebrates before and appeared rather foolish. In the eyes of our ancestors, they were like delicacies in a self-service restaurant. So, with stronger air-breathing abilities, the time spent on land would increase. If their muscles and skeletal structures were more developed, they could eat more with each venture ashore. As a result, the respiratory and terrestrial locomotion capabilities of these tetrapod-like fishes grew stronger and stronger, making the lobe fin fishes increasingly aware of the richness of the land. In this process, the descendants of the initial rulers of vertebrates seem to reignite their ambition to conquer the world. Around 375 million years ago, during the Devonian period, Tiktilik emerged as the first tetrapod-like fish capable of completely leaving the water and moving freely on land for a period. From this point onwards, vertebrates began to venture further inland, embarking on an unstoppable journey of terrestrial conquest. Finally, by at least 360 million years ago, the first true amphibian, Ixi ostiga, emerged. Although by modern standards, these early tetrapatomorpha could only drag their heavy bodies and crawl through the mud with feeble limbs, they were already enough to spread terror in the land as creatures called vertebrates. At this moment, Ichthyostiga stands at the edge of the forest on land. Perhaps it would appreciate the abundance that the land created over millions of years. From this very moment, Vertebrates begin to bestow upon the world the most desperate terror and the most sorrowful sighs.